Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And Jessica, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm sure you're as keen as I am to get Ooh. quizzing Karen <laughs> on her thoughts on the subject at hand, but also for the UK market. And as you probably know, as Jessica was just saying before, um, you are the first CEO of the UK market for WPP, a huge, iconic UK company. At a pivotal time, I suppose that's a reflection of the importance of this mature market, but also the challenges that it mm. faces with issues like Brexit further down the line, and not to mention a leadership change at the top, which was quite a high-profile change a few months ago. Um, we're going to be talking about 35 to 40 minutes, so I'm going to ask us to keep our points concise, but I also want to open it up to questions very quickly. Uh, if you want, also try and tweet me some of your questions at endosantoscnn and also to the HK Creativity uh, hashtag as well. So, Karen, um, let's get going. The ad market. It's in a challenging spot, but a sweet spot at the moment, especially when it comes to creativity and technology, um, and the issue of humanity, as Richard was mentioning before, because companies are getting on board with issues, events, companies are able to determine, how can I say, mass personalization with technological advances that make it more cost effective to do so. How do you see the landscape playing out from here? Because three or four years ago, people may not have realized that it would have moved on quite so quickly. Look, it, I think it's a really interesting one. So I think um, our industry really has to look at technology which affects consumer behaviour. And we need to think about technology as a way of it actually contributing to creativity. So any technology which consu changes consumer behaviour we have to watch um, because it means that our communication strategy have to change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that we don't like to say out loud very often, um, but is true, is that consumers aren't interested in advertising. They are too busy living their own stories, living their own lives, to be interested in a brand story. Mm -hmm. And as much as there are technological changes that allow us to fine-tune and target and do mass personalisation, there is technology that allows consumers to avoid our advertising. So in our industry and what we should be doing in communications is ensuring that we create brand stories which reflect a consumer story and technology can absolutely help with that because it helps us really identify what is relevant for our consumers to make sure that we stand out. Is there a biting point though at which it's dangerous to go too far. Obviously yeah. Richard mentioned the case of Nike and Colin Kaepernick for instance. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, politics in the UK, in the US, in some of the biggest, most developed, most lucrative markets are becoming increasingly polarised. And how does an advertising company or any company, communications company, make sure that they're on the right side of any of their potential customers' messages? Because not everybody shares the same point of view. Look, again, that's where data and technology should be really used to really understand what our customers and consumers are interested in. And any message that we put out has to be relevant. It has to have, it has to be either entertaining, it has to be, have a, a utility so that it's actually useful for that target audience. Um, because I think there was a stat from YouGov that 55% of Brits actually find personalised ads quite annoying. Um, and it's almost on the verge of stalking. So there is that balance in terms of being entertaining or being a utility to make sure that we are helping our target audience. And again, something that we really have to remember in the communications industry is the importance of trust. There is a brilliant book called The Trusted Advisor that looks at that equation in terms of how you build trust. So it equals credibility plus reliability absolutely has to look at empathy divided by self-orientation. So the credibility and reliability comes from the brand or product itself. So the cost, the quality of service, the customer experience when you, you know, call up a, a help centre or call line. The area that we can affect with communications is about empathy, so really understanding what is required from a brand for that consumer, and self-orientation, which is less about us and more about them. And that it is so important that we remember that because trust is really hard to gain. Um, only one in four consumers trust brands. So it's really hard to ascertain and gain. Now, in a, 
when we were talking in a pre -conver preparatory conversation to this event, um, you were showing some of your views on programmatic advertising. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be quite a big fan of it because, uh, as I said, it um, allows companies like WPP and your clients to have a sort of mass personalization experience as long as, as you were saying before, it doesn't go too far mm. and become annoying, but it is also uh, an environment that is prone to problems, Absolutely. notably placements of advertisements with content that wouldn't necessarily be a spouse or that particular yeah. brand. Yeah. How do you think um, we can get over this problem? And will there always be an element of that being a risk? Look, I think um, all of our operating companies um, from WPP have to really think about three areas. Um, and these were the sort of three buzzwords um, from last year and this year, you absolutely have to focus on brand safety um, and that's why uh, Group M um, within WPP appointed a brand safety executive, a, brand, a global brand safety executive to really focus on brand safety to make sure we are helping our clients navigate the areas to make sure that the ad is seen in the right environment. So that is so important. It must be a Herculean task though. It is, it is, but it's our responsibility. So absolutely programmatic advertising can ensure that we reach consumers at the right time and we can do it at scale and we can do it with agility, but there's a responsibility that comes with that. So absolutely brand safety is key and we have to work in partnership with our technological partners as well to do this. Ad fraud is really important. We really need to make sure that our ads are being seen by humans and not bots. And I think there was an estimate that about $12.5 billion um, was what the cost to industry was of ad fraud last year. So you absolutely have to make sure that we are able to use pre-bid ad verification tools to make sure our ads are being seen by the right people. And again, working in partnership with our media owner partners to make sure that they allow those third party ad verification tools. And then viewability as well is so important. So making sure that, you know, it is being seen by humans, making sure that we do have standards and our standards at WPP in terms of what is acceptable tends to be higher than the industry standards. So it's not about 50% of the ads for two seconds, it's 75% of the ad for five seconds. What's the best communication tool out there at the moment because obviously this changes every five minutes depending on which market you're looking at I don't and age group <laughs> I don't think there's any one so mm. to, exactly to that point Nina it, it depending on who you're talking to and what the message is that you're trying to put across I don't think there are, you could absolutely say any one communication tool. If you had to pick five then for different age groups it, what are it, people what are people using today it, because last last year it was snapchat twitter Apparently it's only us journalists on Twitter these days, <laughs> um, reinforcing our own message. Um, Facebook, you often hear people um, you know, bemoaning the fact that Facebook is for 40 year olds, quote unquote. Um, presumably none of these messages are true, <laughs> yeah. but, but it takes five minutes for a particular technology that people have invested a huge communication strategy on to go out of fashion and then they have to start again. But that's why we should be looking at a communication system. It's about how you use different communication avenues together. It's, uh, you know, I still believe in the power of TV, despite conversations about, you know, social media and how social media can get you the reach, it can build brands. I believe in the power of TV in conjunction with other media. I mean, if you look at um, the top 100 global brands, the thing that they have in common is that they sort of disrupted before they uh, they disrupted their categories, but also they did use social media mm -hmm. um, and created a frictionless experience for their consumers. But it's how you do things in conjunction, and you know, there's always conversations about millennials and how do we engage millennials. Um, first thing is don't call them millennials. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, what that target audience is looking for is absolutely what a brand can do for them, a brand mm. that shares their purpose, a brand, you know, this target audience is so used to being things being immediate, 95% of them expect a response from a brand within an hour. So there is a combat and you then need to find the tools and the channels that help with that. So I don't, I can't, I honestly can't say there's any one channel, it's about a communication system 
and how you use that system to get the right message at the right time. Things being feed relevant and feed ready as well. A lot of what you're talking about is um, human capital intensive and um, also the creativity element of an advertising company like yourselves mm. cannot be outsourced to a computer. No. You're facing a lot of competition from people like the uh, the consultancy world largely because advertising is becoming so dependent on data and that's their forte. But creativity is still key to your business and presumably with Brexit around the corner that's something you're worried about when it comes to keeping the UK a creative hub, especially for the ad market and communications? Look, I, creativity, I think, is a huge tool for business transformation. And I think where we work with consultants and where we see consultants going into companies, I think there's absolutely expertise on both parts, you know, the part of WPP and the consultants when it comes to data and technology. Um, what I think WPP and our operating brands add that some of those consultants don't have is creativity at scale. Um, so it's that combination of new creativity to solve business issues, not just marketing communications, we absolutely have. And you're right, Brexit round the corner in terms of talent and how we hold on to talent is a concern. Um, at WPP, around 15% of our talent is from the EU and the UK is seen as a market where if you are in the creative industry sector you can make your career because we are a hub for a number of global brands being able to start their communication strategy across the globe. So it is a concern and you do see other markets like Amsterdam trying to attract businesses as well as talent to sort of move post-March 2019. But I think that the UK is a wonderful fruit salad of people. Mm. That enhances creativity. That sort of diversity absolutely is the key to creativity. And with Brexit around the corner, we as companies and as business leaders need to make sure we do absolutely everything we can to ensure that you know, we hold on to that talent and we still become a beacon for talent in the UK. And as we just heard in your biography, um, you are a very significant figure when it comes to diversity in the United Kingdom. You're also on steering committees for Brexit and so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to the, the issues of humanity, creativity over the last year, the Me Too movement and so on and so forth, what are your thoughts on that and how as we were saying before, we've gone past that sort of biting point where mm. brands are nervous of getting involved in these issues and are actually embracing them. Look, I think, um, and this is something, I think they gave me an OBE to shut me up because I just keep on talking about the need for diversity, not because it's the right thing to do, but it's also about future-proofing your business. Um, it's as simple as that. If you have a workforce that does not reflect your consumer client base, you are just managing a decline. And I think with all of the movements that have happened, it is about championing equality and championing diversity. And that is the key. It absolutely is the key to creativity. I want to make sure, and this is something that I talk to our UK CEOs a lot at WPP about an Avengers Assemble of Talent. So everybody, and I genuinely believe this, has a superhero power. So all of our operating companies have a massive superhero power. And it's about how you connect to those different powers to sort of join together as one team. And that means that you have to start looking at people that are different to you. Start looking at people that have got, you know, different backgrounds, different thought processes, cognitive diversity, so that you can come up with the best ideas. Let's start taking some questions from the audience. I recognise that there's loads of different topics that we haven't yet covered. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? There are microphones in, in the background. Don't be shy. You've only got 20 more minutes with Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Have I missed anybody? No? Nope. All right, then. Um, ah, that might be easier. Thank you. No? Nope. Right. Not yet. Oh, one. Sorry. Apologies. Um, there's just a microphone coming. Thanks very much. It's Rene Russ from GSK. Um, one of the things that really interests me is uh, in this post-factual era that I think you touched on in some of the comments, 
Um, simplicity of message is absolutely key, and I quite often see cases where a complicated, true, and important message gets overridden by something that's simplistic, and I think we see this in US um, circumstance quite frequently at the moment. How, how do we deal with that best from the comms perspective? Look, I, I, I think what I was saying earlier about the, the, the best communications are when a brand story reflects a consumer story. And I do believe technology is that enabler um, to sort of find out what that human truth is that we amplify. And I think when you look at any data or any studies in terms of the best advertising, the best communications, those brands which you know, are the top 100 brands in terms of, of growth, there has been a simple human truth. There has been a concerted effort and consistency of message. Because I do think as brands we tend to chop and change a lot, that we feel as though we need to have six different messages that we change every five minutes in order to make sure that we stay relevant and don't lose appeal. But I, I genuinely think it's about that human truth which comes from core insight, consistency of message, but also authenticity as well. So that's the other thing. Sometimes we have brands which will portray a message in order to try and make sure that we have perfect purpose, which is just not authentic. And we have to treat our consumers with respect. So simplicity is about doing the test on somebody that isn't marketing trained to make sure that does this stack up, does this make sense? You always need a naive witness coming into your team. Again, that thing about having an Avengers Assemble to make sure that naive witness comes in to find out, does this message make sense? Can we absolutely make sure we have a concerted effort behind it and not keep flipping and changing, which we tend to do in our industry, because we get bored easily. Would you mind if I ask, sir, did you say you were from GSK? So obviously, presumably, this is um, a concerning environment when we have fake news, if you're um, disseminating scientific messaging and so on and so forth. Would you like to share your view on this particular subject? Thanks very much. I'm actually working in uh, external communications for vaccines, and uh, you can well imagine that's a topic that uh, obviously has a very high relevance in this area. Um, so I'm particularly concerned about uh, what we recently found out. There's some peer-reviewed publications that show that um, there are actually bots uh, being used by some Russian agencies that have actually accused of this, that apparently also meddled with US elections uh, to fuel the anti-vax um, sentiment in populations. So, um, and the interesting thing for me is that in my, in my area of communications, you know, the industry does a lot to actually communicate the safety of vaccines, the, the benefits of vaccines, really the value of vaccines for, for you know, humanity and, and societies. Um, and that often very easily gets overridden by a simple message of somebody saying, you know, something's happened with the vaccines. And that. So I think this is for us very specifically because it's got a very, very direct impact on, mm. you know, our economies and our, on our societies. And, and I believe that it's also filtered through to Europe because Italy's changed the laws on the obligation right. of vaccines and the government in Italy absolutely is well right. known for being very close to uh, that country that you Spot mentioned on, called yeah, Russia. That's right. Thank you very much, sir. Fascinating points mm. of view. Does anybody else have another uh, point that they would like to make a question right at the back there? Thank you. Um, I totally resonate with everything that you've said, and I really do. Com I'm coming from a consumer's perspective, and we do definitely feel bombarded by messages, targeted marketing. You do feel like you're being stalked, for sure. And I, I'm interested in your perspective from a television point of view. How do you combat the whole thing where everyone wants to forward ads. Like, for instance, I would watch something on Planet to avoid ads, that kind of thing. So unless it's an amazing campaign that someone is talking about that's very interesting, has possibly a star element that is you know, different, I would seek the ad out. But otherwise, I'd really avoid all the ads on television. But I do understand that you feel it's powerful, but how would you combat that? Sorry, I didn't quite hear the end of that question. Uh, how would, you, how would you combat people just forwarding ads and just avoiding ads on television? The so, campaigns that you mean, like you said, television is important still. So, so again, this is back to the point about we should look at our communications as part of a communication system. And again, making sure that the advertising that we create reflects a consumer story. So you're, you will pay attention to an ad if it is relevant to you and you can see some of your own story reflected in that brand story. There's a brilliant quote um, by John Steinbeck that basically says, if the story is not about the reader, they will not listen. And it's the same with our advertising. If it's not about 
the consumer, they will not listen. But it's not the dependence on one ad either. So again, we have so many of our consumers that dual screen, that an ad is appearing on TV and there's a second screen, a mobile screen, which they're on as well. And we have, again, advances in technology which allow us to sync a TV ad with a message which is going on on our mobile phone or on our tablet as well to make sure that the two work together. So if you're starting to looking at fast forwarding an ad, there is another message which can come up on your dual screen at the same time. So it, again, I think it's about TV plus. It's not about TV on its own. And it's about understanding the role for different communications channel to get across that brand story which reflects the consumer story. And again, there's so much data to show that the number of people that are skipping ads um, is actually reduced when you absolutely make sure that that ad is relevant. The, the messaging is, and also the, the, the method of delivering messages has changed so much so quickly. And it doesn't seem as though we're quite there yet as to whether we understand whether we should be pushing ads at people, allowing people to pull ads, mm. um, in, or not just ads, but any communication message that they want off of any device, the internet, TV, so be it. What's the best modus operandi to choose? Because there is still, there's still a lot of content out there that will push a 14-second advert at you before a video, mm. um, which, as we all know, gets people to turn off and they never actually get to the video. And if they're watching things on tablets and devices and not necessarily on appointment-to-view television, how do you actually reach them before they turn off? Look, I, I think you have to have a real understanding. This, again, is why people are so important. Technology is an enabler. Mm -hmm. um, it is not the answer, but it's why people um, and talented people are so important. Um, you really have to understand how consumers are using different channels and for what purpose. Mm -hmm. um, you saw the number of people installing ad blockers in the UK increase when publishers try to maximise viewability um, in order to sort of negotiate with agencies to make sure that you, you had more advertising seen so that the cost that you pay increases. And you see that. Yeah. Um, but what's really important is, you know, we, we sort of plateaued in the UK in terms of the amount of ad blockers that are being installed on phones, sort of peaked at around about 21, 22% mm -hmm. of the UK. And again, it's about making sure that we really understand what we're trying to do for that particular brand and the role of the channel in that particular brand. So is it useful? Is it entertaining? Does it have purpose which reflects the consumer purpose? TV, are we trying to build a brand? Are we trying to remind people about a brand? It's really understanding the role of the different channels and what we do because the answer is not always an ad. That's what we've got to remember in our industry. What do you think is the best and most effective communication strategy you've seen this year? Ooh, uh, uh, there are so many case studies that come from um, our different operating companies. And last, was it last year? Yeah, last year I was... It doesn't um, have to come from your operating no, no, companies. No, but <laughs> l last year, there well, we've got amazing operating <laughs> companies. Uh, last year I was a judge at Cannes um, for the titanium and integrated um, Cannes Lions. And there were some themes that I saw last year, which was just because you can doesn't mean you should, mm -hmm. um, where people have run away with the capabilities of technology and data to do things which weren't useful. Just futile. It's just, what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. How's it helping anybody? What's it doing for consumers? How's it useful? How's it entertaining? And you saw lots of that. You really genuinely did. Um, and I, I remember writing a piece about it in terms of my thoughts from Cannes. Uh, and I remember one campaign uh, using a piece of technology which was um, used to design a dress which was worn to uh, an awards ceremony. And I was thinking, oh, that's interesting, because it had sort of mm. scraped loads of data from all of the different dress dresses which mm -hmm. were, you know, topping lists and seen and got loads of views um, and loads of pages of PR and publicity. And I was thinking, oh, that's easy. How from all of that you scrape all of mm -hmm. the information to design a dress? I think that's interesting. Did it look good, though? <laughs> and, and they should have stopped there. <laughs> but instead... They decided that they were then going to add lights to the dress based on sentiments of people tweeting yeah, I've seen this uh, at the award show 
about the dress. So then this dress changed colour based on sentiment of people mm. tweeting. And I'm like, what the bloody hell was the point <laughs> of that? Who goes out wearing a dress that changes colour and lights up? Yeah. I don't remember going into my local shop to arts. I need a dress that changes colour. Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's an example of just because you can doesn't mean you should. One of my favourite ads um, that I saw when I was, was judging was actually from um, Tide. So laundry detergent, mm -hmm. um, you know, an everyday, um, you know, product that we, we tend to use that can be a low interest category. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was in the States and, uh, and, you know, the Super Bowl tends to be, you know, the big, yeah. big, you know, forum for, for advertising. And I loved what they did with the Tide stain, the Bradshaw stain. I loved that ad just because it was an example of how you actually combine different communications channels mm -hmm. to amplify a brand and to entertain. So I loved that ad. That was a great example. Mm -hmm. There are brilliant examples of where we've done mass personalization respectfully as mm -hmm. well, without merging and moving into that stalker mm -hmm. arena. So there's a share a Coke campaign where in the UK um, we used a tiny piece of data, which was Channel 4's uh, 4OD um, sign in, your login mm -hmm. when you sign in, in order to get a message which was pre-roll of a Coke bottle which came up with your name on it, which was share a coat with Nina or share a coat with Karen. And that led to, you know, using a database of 12 million 4OD users, mm -hmm. you ended up with 4 million personalised ads. Mm -hmm. um, and that saw purchase intent increase by 24%. Mm -hmm. So there are some brilliant examples of where we are using tech and data respectfully yeah. in order to entertain and get a brand communicated and seen. Let's see if there's another couple of questions in the audience. Do we have any more questions? There's just a microphone coming towards you, just in front of the pillar, thanks. Hi there. My name is Louise O'Sullivan. I also work at GSK. Hi, Rene. We haven't met yet, but I'll, I'll catch you at lunch. Um, I'm quite new. I sense a conspiracy. <laughs> right, in the same seat, though. So, um, I'm also ex WPP, actually, so many years ago. Um, my question, um, for Karen, is about creative culture. It's something I'm really interested in. So, I'm the um, tech and digital director at GSK, um, but also have a background in creative agencies. Um, it strikes me that all of the amazing creativity that's come out of Silicon Valley recently, obviously we've also seen the reputational damage um, with Uber and Tesla and Facebook, etc. Um, and I wanted to know, Karen, very specifically, what your thoughts are in terms of culture. You mentioned diversity, but I'm really interested also in um, advertising agencies I've worked in. Very male-dominated, a um, bit of a bro culture going on, and I just wondered where we're at on that journey to make it more inclusive and uh, to make it, um, ultimately, the agencies produce better work, in my opinion. So, it's, it's culture literally is something which is worked on and is really hard, but it comes from the top, it comes from the middle, and it comes from pipeline, and you absolutely have to have a strategy for all areas. There was... Um, you might get this, I'm stato, because I've sort of got a media background, so I tend to remember lots of stats. There was a um, study by uh, Deloitte University, probably about four or five years ago, that talked about covering. And it talked about um, covering, which is the way that people suppress their natural selves and their natural personalities in order to fit in with the mainstream at work, in order to try and progress at work. And it's a horrendous stat that 61% of people, and they surveyed loads of different industry sectors, um, loads of different sort of levels, um, and 61% of people cover. Um, so they're suppressing and changing who they are to try and fit in with a workplace culture. Uh, that figure increases to 66% if you're a woman, 78% if you're black, and 83% if you identify as LGBTQ+, which is horrendous. So 
in order to fuel creativity and foster creativity, you've got to be able to bring yourself to work. It, it comes from having lots of different cognitive diversity in one place to come up with great ideas. So creating a workplace culture which is about inclusion. So I always talk about diversity means that you, I'm allowed in the room. Inclusion means I've got a sit, seat at the table and I'm heard. So creating workplace cultures in order to really look and focus on inclusion has to come from leadership and it has to come from the top. It has to come from some mandates and policies as well that come from the top. But then you have to make sure that you focus on how you keep people so that things change at the top. So there's lots of effort going in and pipeline, which is absolutely right, that we're fishing in different pools to bring different people in. And that's absolutely right with programmes on apprenticeships, programmes which make sure that you don't look at degree level, that you take, remove degree level qualifications and entries to come in, and that you do lots of outreach to schools, which is absolutely the right thing to do, but that will take time. Um, you also have to focus on the people that are already there in middle management, because you often hear you have to see it to be it, and when those people in middle management then look above and there's no one that sort of reflects their diversity in that senior team, it's hard and you churn out and you don't create those inclusive cultures. So uh, I know H&K do an amazing sort of mentoring programme to make sure that more women come through to the top um, in the HER programme that you do to make sure that more women actually come through so that you've got that equality in terms of thinking and let's face it, 83% of the UK is female when it comes to consumer purchasing. If the consumer economy had a gender, it's female. Um, so that's really important. So that squeezed middle doing programs such as reverse mentoring and sponsorship to ensure they stay. And also making sure that our leaders really get it. Not just a tick box exercise to say I've done it, but really get it because this is about future proofing your business. So I think there is a range of initiatives. There's not one thing. And I think policy really helps as well. You know, the, the gender pay gap reporting that we've had to do in the UK, whether some companies like it or not, means that you have to really focus on understanding your teams and what you're doing to make sure that you've got the right mix in your teams. I really want the same when it comes to ethnicity and an ethnic pay gap report as well, because once it becomes legislation or policy, there then tends to be a focus. Just Sorry, that was a very long answer. But the Great focusing answer. specifically on the, 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 um, the female dynamic, um, Sir Martin Sorrell, when he was still um, in the top job at WPP, told me at Ad Week last year that he, that he didn't think that his successor would be a woman at the time, or indeed for some time after that. Has that changed at WPP, now that obviously the management has changed? Look, I think... Absolutely. I think Mark is really focused on talent and he's focused on talent coming in any form. Um, you know, it, it, to a certain extent, Martin, you know, was talking about, look, there's only seven female CEOs in the FTSE 100 and that has been the case for some time. Um, so, you know, to give you know Martin and to think about what he was saying and to try and be objective there is it's not just about WPP it is about our context, industry yeah. um, where there is only seven female CEOs but I think Mark absolutely is focused on talent he is focused on respect as well um, you know there was a memo that came out within WPP about this is a company which is about respect and um, you can see it in terms of the team that, that Mark is assembling around him, that is a diverse team of people and diverse and modern ways of thinking. Now on that note, uh, oh, we suddenly have a couple more questions. Do, do I have the, the latitude to take one more? Okay, so we'll it could take be a short questions. answer. So. Is it a yes or no answer? It could be. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Steve Miller. I work for Eco with the Global Umbrella Body for PR and Comms. Um, I'm not paid by CanLines, um, but we do partner with CanLines, given this is about creativity. You've talked about being a judge. For 2019, any indication of what WPP stance will be with Can and entering for the holding companies, or would you rather talk in private about that? Look, I, I think... Um 
can this year there was a focus back to creativity so I think you know in previous years there's a big focus on the ad tech companies and tech and data and what that can do and as I've been saying earlier I absolutely believe that data and tech should be a contributor to creativity and you saw this year more of a focus on creativity and more conversations actually about inclusion and diversity and loads of companies getting it and understanding it. You know, I think us going to awards like Cannes, I think is important. I think it's important for our talent, for their work, for our clients to be recognised. Um, you know, but that's really a question for Mark. I can tell you my own personal perspective. Uh, and from the UK, I, I really believe in making sure that reputationally all of our hard work in terms of delivering growth for clients is recognised. Thank you. I'll ask Mark then. Well, on that note, thank you very much. Karen Blackett, I'm sure you've all found that talk incredibly inspiring.